Thank you. Um, this is an exciting event. Um, it brings together so many things for a particular purpose, which is also uh, of great moment in the modern world. And I have uh, learned a lot of things in the short time I've been able to be a part of it this morning. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and uh, uh, since I became an anthropologist, uh, the world has changed a great deal, and anthropology studies the modern world and tries to keep up with the changes. And I think we're now riding a wave of change in the modern world that makes it possible to do things like this in much more useful and productive ways than ever was possible in the past. And it's, very, it's a great privilege to be a part of it, as well as to have the honor of, of introducing Dr. Julio Frank. Um, I, I don't think there's any uh, danger in overemphasizing or repeating too many times the fact that we've crossed a threshold into a period of world history uh, which presages probably most of the future of world history in which more than half of the world's population lives in cities. Uh, and I think that this draws our attention to a type of change, of accelerating change in the world uh, that um, is making qualitative differences to almost everything that we're interested in. It's making a, a different, changing careers, it's changing education, it's changing relationships, it's changing daily life, um, because uh, when people live in cities, they live in larger communities, they interact more with more people, they are forced to um, do new, th that, well, they're drawn into networks that make it necessary for them to do new things that they wouldn't have thought to do in the past. Uh, and this in particular obviously changes the lives of women because it changes gender relations. Um, it's this acceleration of change uh, as the, the whole world, the life of even the most isolated parts of the world are drawn into the influence of urban institutions uh, that we are focusing on and looking at uh, how it affects the lives of women and in, particularly, in particular the health of, the health of women. Um, the, uh, about 10 years ago, somebody, and I think it was a professor at Harvard, um, announced that he thought that the, the 21st century was going to be the biological century. Um, I've, I can't tell you exactly what the context of his prediction was, but it was a, a prediction that made a lot of sense to anthropologists because as more and more people lived together in cities and uh, ceased to be living in spatially distributed separate cultural communities, but come together in cities where they're interacting with strangers from different cultural communities. They're, the culture that you grow up with ceases to be a discipline that you have to abide by in order to, to avoid being censured by your neighbors and becomes more uh, uh, what you remember to use to rationalize what you did when somebody challenges you to ask you why you did that. Uh, more and more people, more and more of us are spending more and more of our time, and not only people like us, but people of all classes of society are spending more and more of their time interacting with people from different cultural backgrounds. And that means that the, the cultural forces of the past, which have had uh, very, a very positive influence uh, in, uh, in history, but also in recent history have begun to have very negative influences and created a lot of ethno-political conflicts. Uh, these cultural forces are being diluted and um, what the human nature that unites us all is, becoming, is beginning to sh more and more to show through on the surface and I think this sort of thing that's happening worldwide to an increasing extent in larger and larger parts of the world uh, is uh, a force for great optimism for meetings like this. 
because we're riding a wave of uh, types of social change that were not conceivable in the past. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that you don't have to do what you came here to do and to work out how to do it better. It means that you can be optimistic about the future and the possibility of what you can achieve. Um, the, one of the most difficult problems about accelerating change is that the faster the, the society changes, the greater the resistance to change that it engenders. And so uh, because change it threatens some people and offers opportunities to others. I think it offers op great opportunities to us for what we're gathered here to think about. And, uh, 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 but a lot of people with vested interests who are afraid of change and are, will be out of, going out of their way to f f uh, fight it. And that's the sort of thing that we have to work out ways to um, uh, um, win over and to um, cancel out and to um, move, um, um, spread the level of awareness of the possibilities of change to um, make it more successful. I think that um, the choice of our speaker this morning um, on a global approach to um, global health, a global focus, a comprehensive focus on global health, um, we could not have a better speaker, since he has a background in, um, uh, which is varied of the type that provides um, the awareness for the full range of possibilities that need to be addressed in this conference. Um, uh, he has been an eminent authority on global health for a long time. Uh, he uh, brings together um, academic and professional qualifications uh, from Mexico and uh, the University of Michigan in this country. Um, he was founding director of the Center for Public Health Research in Mexico's Ministry of Health in the 80s, founding director general of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, one of the leading institutions of health education and research in the developing world. Um, which guided its, uh, he guided its emergence as one of the developing world's most respective and innovative centers of education and research in public health. Then he became visiting professor at the Harvard School of Public Health um, in the 90s and returned there as a visiting professor again more recently uh, before um, becoming dean. Uh, he served as, as in the mid-90s as executive vice president of the Mexican Health Foundation and director of its Center for uh, Health and the Economy, one of the leading institutions of health education and research in the developing world. Um, in 1998, Dr. Frank joined the World Health Organization as executive director in charge of evidence and information for policy. Uh, which was WHO's first ever unit explicitly charged with developing a scientific foundation for health policy to achieve better outcomes. And then at the end of the 90s, 1998 to 2000, he served as executive director of evidence and information for policy at WHO. Um, as Minister of Health in Mexico from 2000 to 2006, um, Dr. Frank pursued an ambitious agenda to reform the nation's health center, uh, system um, uh, with, with an emphasis on redressing social inequality and establishing a program of comprehensive national insurance known as Seguro Popular, for which he is probably best known because it expanded health, uh, access to health care for tens of millions um, previously uninsured Mexicans. After completing his term as minister, he served as a senior fellow uh, of the Global Health Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and president of the Caso Health Institute in Mexico City. It's uh, not surprising then, uh, after this uh, a career of such achievement, that Dr. Frank received the Clinton Global Citizen Award for changing the way practitioners and policymakers across the world think about health. He was cited for outstanding leadership and innovation in solving global challenges. Uh, then Dr. Frank became 
dean of the Harvard Pub School of Public Health in uh, uh, January last year, and also the uh, TNG Angelopoulos Professor of Public Health and International Development. Uh, he's author of 28 books and monographs and many articles in academic journals as well as cultural magazines and newspapers. Um, and uh, uh, in case you wondered uh, what he does in the evenings, he's written two best-selling novels for youngsters explaining functions of the human body, uh, which we learned about in the vestibule this morning and uh, several of us will be recommending to uh, young mothers in the next few weeks. Uh, I'm very happy and very honored to be able to introduce to you Dr. Julio Frank uh, to speak on Women and Health, a Comprehensive Focus for Global Health. Dr. Frank. Good morning to everyone, and thank you, Professor Spooner, for your kind introduction. Um, I've had a long career, but certainly one of the great highlights was that as, just as I was starting after my studies, I got to meet Afaf Milis, and uh, that's been something that's uh, enriched my life ever since. Uh, she's an inspiring leader, um, has learned, uh, taught me to think much more broadly about questions of women and health. So I want to thank, start by thanking her very much for the opportunity to be here with, with all of you today, and especially following the, I think, marvelous, inspirational presentation by Ambassador Melanie Verveer. Uh, I think the United States is really uh, uh, providing a long overdue leadership to the world uh, when it comes to women's center development, uh, both through President Obama and Secretary Clinton and now with Ambassador Bevere in this very important position that you all heard about. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and uh, as you know, the, the, um, the topic for this year's conference is devoted to the intersection of three topics women, health, and cities. Um, so what I will uh, try to do in the next few minutes is exactly to, to address uh, this intersection among those three fundamental topics of, of our times. Uh, my main message today is that health offers a window through which uh, we can understand the most pressing challenges facing women in our global urban society. Uh, during the past few years, the big change in global health is that health has stopped being the sole concern of domain experts. And instead, health has been placed at the center of the key issues in the global agenda. The issues of economic development, of global security, of democratic governance, of human rights and of gender equity. And it's this idea that health is no longer what we health experts and professionals are solely, are, are the only people concerned, but it's now the topic of economists and diplomats and people concerned with security and people concerned with the status of women. Health has become a central part of all of those agendas. So to elaborate on this message, I will divide my remarks in three parts. In the first one, I'll set the context by examining the growing complexity that characterizes the global health field. Women's concerns occupy center stage in this field, so in the second part, I will analyze the evolution of the concepts that have been used to reflect the priority topics on the agenda of women and health, and uh, uh, I will propose a novel approach, a comprehensive approach, based on the concept of women and health. And then finally, in the third part, I will um, use uh, my recent experience as Minister of Health in Mexico to tell you about a real life case that illustrates the application of this comprehensive concept of women and health in the, in the middle of a large scale health reform. And this may have some interesting implications for other parts of the world. So let, let me start with um, the context. I think that more, more than ever before, we are all keenly aware that in health matters, we're really, the, the world really has become a, a neighborhood. And if you look the meaning of neighborhood in Wikipedia, neighborhood is, the, is, is defined as a place you are already in when you walk out of your door. Um, so global is not the opposite of domestic. Uh, you know, especially speaking here in the United States, I like to repeat that because the last time I saw 
the map of the world, the United States was very much part of that. And very often we say global health to mean foreign health. But global health is not foreign health. It's not the opposite of domestic. Global health is about that that connects and involves all of those. It's about interdependence when it comes uh, to health matters. And this awareness about the fact that we really have become a single neighborhood in health matters comes at a time of unprecedented change. We are in the midst of a tense and intense health transition unlike anything the world has seen before. And this transition is linked to broader demographic, social, and economic transformations. There has been really a fundamental shift in the nature of death, disease, and disability. To begin with, during the 20th century, the world as a whole experienced a larger gain in life expectancy than in all the previously accumulated history of humankind. We started the 20th century in 1900 with about 30 years of life expectancy as the global average. By 1985, life expectancy had reached 62 years. So in that short period, less than a century, we had a larger gain than in all the previously accumulated history of humankind. Today, the estimate for the world is 66.6 years of life expectancy, but with huge differences. Japan stands today with 82 years of life expectancy, Swaziland with 32. So there's a 50-year gap. So today, we have a larger gap than everything we gained during the 20th century. That's the nature of inequality. Notwithstanding those inequalities, the fact is that almost every country, except countries in sub-Saharan Africa that had a reversal because of the AIDS epidemic, um, have experienced an improvement in life expectancy. And this is just one of dramatic changes in the structure of the world population that are occurring as we speak. Because they are not cataclysmic, we tend to lose sight of these changes. But that doesn't make them any important. And as the very famous demographer Joel Cohen has pointed out, already just during the first decade of the 21st century, we have already, or the world has already witnessed three firsts in the history of uh, humankind. In the year 2000, for the very first time in history, older people outnumbered younger people. That had never happened before. And that year, there were more people over 60 years of age than under five years of age in the world. In 2003, the world, again, for the first time in human history, reached, the world as a whole, reached replacement fertility. This means that the average woman started having just enough children during her lifetime to replace herself and the father in the following generation. Now, again, there are huge differences here, ranging from 7.7 .7 children per woman in Niger, in, in Niger and 6.5 in Afghanistan to 1.09 in Singapore. So, you know, the, the differences are, are staggering. But still, as a whole, again, for the first time, there's now replacement fertility. And then very relevant to this conference, between 2007 and 2008, the urban population outnumbered the rural population, again, for the first time ever. So from a world mostly populated by children, of which many were born and most died, or a huge proportion of them died before re reaching uh, adulthood, that was mostly rural, uh, we, have, we are now in a totally different world. And given the theme of the conference, let me de uh, devote a few minutes to this last mega trend of uh, having already crushed this threshold that's been noted repeatedly in this conference of urbanization. Uh, I mean, we first, we first need to understand that a certain level of urban concentration is desirable and even enjoyable. Cities are centers for economic activity and employment. And since I'm a native of, uh, of one of the largest metropolises of the world, I, I like cities. Uh, they are uh, the quintessential niche of modern living. They are the places where female labor force participation is most common. There are places that encourage diversity and where alternative ways of living are better tolerated and even promoted. Cities are also social and cultural emporiums that house all kinds of manifestations in the arts, science, religion, and entertainment. Up to a point, increased population density reduces the pressures of human beings on local ecosystems, since it, in, it usually implies 
lower per capita costs of providing infrastructure and basic services. Urban residents tend to enjoy better access to education, healthcare, electricity, water, and sanitation than inhabitants of rural areas. However, there's also a dark side because rapid and overextended urbanization in the absence of urban planning and regulatory institutions ends up producing costs that exceed the benefits of living in urban conglomerates. Long commutes, traffic accidents, high levels of air and water pollution, violence, stress, and the squalor of slums. Developing countries are experiencing both fast and extended urbanization. At the beginning of the 20th century, 16 cities in the world had 1 million inhabitants or more, and almost all of them were located in developed countries. Today, there are close to 400 cities with a million inhabitants or more, and about 70% of them are in the developing world. Mega cities are also becoming particularly common in low and middle income countries. According to UN projections, by 2015, 16 of the 22 cities with more than 10 million people will be located in the global south. One of the characteristics of urban growth in developing countries is the explosive increase of the urban poor. In many developing nations, the proportion of urban poor is increasing at a faster rate than the overall rate of urban population growth. Around 72% of city dwellers in Africa, 72%, live in slums. The figure is 43% for Asia and the Pacific, and 32% for Latin America. So still, you know, a third of people living in slums in Latin America. Rapid urban growth throughout the developing world has surpassed the capacity of cities to provide adequate services for their inhabitants. To the lack of basic services, we should add the problems of social exclusion, spatial segregation, and alienation generated by the large immigration of populations fleeing rural poverty, political oppression, or natural disasters. As cities in low and middle income countries grow, the effects of urbanization on health and its pressures on health services become increasingly complex. This complexity is not is due not so much to the lack of resources, which is implied in the term underdevelopment, a quantitative idea, underdevelopment, you have not enough resources. I prefer the concept coined by the French sociologist Alain Touraine, who spoke of maldevelopment, which is more of a qualitative notion that refers to failed models of development. Many cities in poor and low and middle income countries are victims of maldevelopment through their poor, poor planning procedures, careless adoption of inadequate urban models, and badly implemented policies. In my view, the essential characteristics of maldevelopment is the juxtaposition of problems. In contrast with the developing model of currently advanced societies, where new problems tended to replace the old problems, in maldeveloped societies, old and new problems coexist in a complex present fraught with contradictions and inequalities. The field of health reflects better than any other this qualitatively different pattern of development. Whereas rich countries, currently rich countries, experience a, substitu experience a substitution of old for new patterns of disease, so as you got rid of infectious diseases, then you got the non-communicable diseases. We don't have in the developing world a substitution. We have a problem of juxtaposition of all problems. And today, if you look across the developing world, what you will witness is a triple burden of disease that's simultaneously operating. First, the unfinished agenda of common infections, malnutrition, and reproductive health problems, most prominently maternal mortality. Without having solved this unfinished agenda, developing countries are already coping with the second burden, which is the emerging challenges represented by non-communicable diseases, mental disorders, and the growing scourge of injury and violence. And then on top of that, if that was not enough, developing all countries in the world, including poor countries, now face health challenges associated with globalization, 
such as pandemics like AIDS or the recent pandemic of human influenza, such as the harmful trade, the trading harmful products like tobacco and other drugs, or the health consequences of climate change, or the transfer of harmful lifestyles, which is dealing to the silent pandemic of obesity, which someone has called globesity, exactly to underscore that these are global problems. So you have a country like India that simultaneously, the same country, has the largest absolute number of undernourished children and obese children in the world. And that's, that's the complexity of global health. And this type of transition is compressed in urban environments, especially in the slums where the very poor tend to concentrate. Limited access to drinking water, inadequate sewer facilities, and insufficient weight disposal favors the dissemination of common infections, which sometimes show higher rates than in rural areas, like in diarrheal disease. But at the same time, the same urban areas are still dealing with diarrhea and common respiratory infections, but now urban lifestyles are exposing those same individuals to risk factors linked to non-communicable ailments like diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and chronic respiratory uh, disease. In their concern for equity, some public health professionals have underestimated a new reality. And the new reality is that problems only of the poor, like maternal deaths, are no longer the only problems of the poor, who also suffer higher rates of non-communicable diseases and mental disorders. In fact, urban populations in developing countries show the highest rates of non-communicable diseases and their associated risk factors like tobacco consumption. So you look at China and you find that 70% of males are smoking today. And that is a global tsunami of non-communicable diseases that's approaching the world. And it's going to have huge consequences for the global economy as China becomes a motor of the world economy exactly at a time when all of those adults are going to be entering into the sick lists because of all the consequences of tobacco consumption. Injuries are also conspicuous in large cities. It is estimated that there's 1.2 million deaths and 50 million injuries every year due to traffic accidents in the world, and most of those happen in developed countries. The rifts in the social fabric, particularly frequent in excluded populations, constitute a fertile soil for the development of mental problems, addictions, and violence. In many, many middle-income countries, two of the main causes of loss of disability-adjusted life years in poor urban dwellings are major depression in women and murder and suicide deaths, among, mostly uh, concentrated among men. So it, add to that all kinds of injuries and psychological sequelae associated with violence, including, of course, domestic violence, which disproportionately is disproportionately directed against women. And as I said, on top of that, you have global environmental problems that are posing additional pressures on poor urban centers. Dengue fever, which was an epidemic disease at the, at the beginning of the 20th century, is becoming an endemic urban phenomenon associated both to slum growth and to global warming. So this is why domestic and global are now completely interconnected. You have the uh, adequate breeding ground in the cities because of concentration, but at the same time, the global uh, patterns in climate are spreading mosquitoes that, that uh, carry dengue fever much more uh, in, in, in areas where it used, they, they used and didn't used to go. So this is sort of a, a, a picture that I would characterize by two words, change and complexity, fast change and growing degrees of complexity. But it's not just, you know, sort of the, this epidemiological and demographic realities. I think that what we're seeing is a shift in the very experience of uh, death and disease, the, 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 the meaning of disease, something that nurses are always uh, dealing with. How, how do human beings actually experience disease? That has changed. Previously, the experience of disease was marked by a succession of acute episodes from when, which one either recovered or died. Now, people spend substantial parts of their lives in less than perfect health, 
coping with a chronic condition, whether it's communicable like AIDS or non-communicable like heart disease. Or... So illness may not always kill us, but it always accompanies us. It is, it's, it stopped being a succession of discrete episodes to become a condition of living, which is very often stigmatized. And it defines, even the way we talk has changed. I mean, people, we now talk of people living with AIDS, living with cancer. People say, I am diabetic. It becomes part of your identity. No one would say, I am diarrheic. No, you would say, I, I have diarrhea, and I either die or get cured. <laughs> but it becomes a condition of living. And as I say, very often stigmatized. To use Susan Sontag's image, we all now have dual citizenship, both in the kingdom of the healthy and in the kingdom of the sick. In the context of this profound health transition, the concepts that reflect the priority of different concerns of women have themselves been evolving. And this leads me to the second part of my lecture. For most of the 20th century, attention in the international arena was limited to maternal health, which refers, refers to the health of women during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. This continues to be a major priority in the global health agenda, as we, we just heard from, from Ambassador Bervier, because as we know, you know, there's half a million deaths, 99% of those occur in developing countries, and this makes maternal mortality the most inequitably distributed health outcome in the world today. And it is also the Millennium Development Goal that's lagging the most towards the, uh, the, the goal for 2015. Within this initial accident on maternal issues, there was a gradual shift from an exclusive concern for mortality to a broader interest in maternal health, including the prevention of disability and the positive promotion of well-being. And this shift was eventually expressed in the adoption of the Safe Motherhood Initiative, a larger concept. Uh, work written by the Boston Women's Health Book Collective in the early 1970s our bodies ourselves, disseminated a still broader approach to women's health that was well ahead of its time. This book contained information on many issues related to women's health and sexuality, including birth control, childbirth, sexual health, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And you know, reflecting this enlargement of the, of the agenda, during the late 1980s and the early 1990s, the focus of international health initiatives related to women was expanded with the adoption of the concept of reproductive health, strongly disseminated during the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo in 1994, and the Fourth World Conference for Women in Beijing in 1995, that again, Ambassador Bevere has referred to. Within this phase, there is also a shift prompted by a solid grassroots movement from an almost exclusive attention to fertility control to a more comprehensive approach to the reproductive needs of women. With the increasing prevalence of non-communicable diseases in developing countries, the concept of women's health began gaining currency in the global arena and attracting attention not only to maternal and reproductive problems, but also to emerging challenges that are exclusive of women, like cervical and breast cancer, or particularly common among them, like depression. This new emphasis signaled the appearance of a third Phase in the recent history of the health concerns of women, which has added an additional layer of complexity. I would like to suggest a fourth construct, women and health, which includes all the previous ones. This integrative framework can be visualized as a set of concentric circles. The innermost circle is occupied by the field of maternal health, which is itself a subset of sexual and reproductive health, contained in the following broader circle. This second field, in turn, is a subset of women's health, which occupies the third circle and goes beyond the reproductive function to adopt a life course perspective, including all the health needs of women. And finally, all of these circles are enclosed by the most external one, women and health, which deals not only with all disease and disability challenges confronted by women, but also with three emerging topics of connection between women and health. First, the role of women as informal providers of care at home. Second, women as formal health professionals, which of course nurses occupy a central position. And third, the adoption of a cross-cutting gender perspective 
which implies the recognition of the influence of socially constructed differences between men and women on their health status, on their access to care, and on the quality of the services they receive. The comprehensive framework just outlined was used in Mexico between 2000 and 2006 to design and implement a national policy with ambitious goals related to all of its dimension. This effort was part of a larger initiative to reform the health system. We do not have time, uh, and I'm aware that I'm getting to the end of my lecture, uh, to go into the details of this reform at any rate this was the subject of a seven-part series in the prestigious journal The Lancet, and anyone who's more interested in the Mexican reform can read there. So what I want just to tell you is a little bit about the reform and then focus on how it linked to this women and health um, uh, uh, construct. The essence of the reform was the effort to introduce national health insurance. Mexico, like the United States, because access to insurance had been tied to formal salary and employment, was in a situation where in the year 2000, half of the population, we have a population of about 100 million people, half of those 50 million were uninsured. And these were all the people that work by themselves, including most of the peasants in the urban areas. It included every self-employed small merchant. It included people outside of the labor force, like full-time homemakers and, or full-time students. And it included the unemployed and those working in the informal sector of the economy. All in all, 50 million people who were uninsured. And very careful analysis and the use of strong evidence revealed that whereas everyone thought that we had a publicly funded system, it turned out that more than half of all expenditures in the country were being provided out of pocket when people actually pay for their care when they need the care. And that's the most unfair way of financing a health system because being sick is not people's fault. So a system that makes the sickest pay the most, which is what out-of-pocket does, is inherently unfair. It's also very inefficient because it doesn't take into account the essential feature of health losses, which is uncertainty. None of us knows when we're going to get sick or when we're going to have a serious accident. So the way you deal with uncertainty is through insurance. And this has to be essentially public insurance or publicly mandated insurance because otherwise you have what you had before the landmark reform that was just passed by the US Congress. You get people being excluded for pre-existing conditions or having waiting periods. And what you want is a health system that protects people at the moment where they most need it. And that's when we, when, when we get sick. We cannot accept the absolutely unacceptable paradox that we know that health is one of the most powerful ways we have of empowering poor people to lift themselves out of poverty. Yet health, paying for health, becomes a major source of impoverishment when societies do not develop a health system that protects everyone from the financial consequences of losing health. And that's exactly what we set out to do. And I will not tell you all the details, but the fact of the matter is we introduced, I guess in the terms of the debate we had here, this would have been called a public option. So it was a public insurance scheme called Seguro Popular that started rolling, starting with the poorest members of society. In 2003, that law was passed. And I'm happy to say <clears throat> that as of the end of last year, already 35 million people out of the target 50 have enrolled in this program. So Mexico is right on schedule to achieve universal insurance by the year 2011, which was the goal set by that law. Now, in the context of this reform, which is a structural reform, <clears throat> we, we realized that it was necessary also to have a clear sense of priorities. This is an imperative in terms of resource allocation, but it's also a way of garnering public support by relating abstract financial and managerial terms like insurance and risk protection and all of that, linking that to specific outcomes. So in my view, every reform has to have a limited number of flagship initiatives to focus attentions on concrete benefits. And from the outset, we decided that this comprehensive framework on women and health would be one of those flagship initiatives. And again, I don't have time to go into details, although I'll leave you a copy of, of, of this, but we, we, we followed those circles. We started with a clear focus on maternal mortality and neonatal mortality, and we launched a flagship initiative called Fair Start in Life, underscoring the notion of equal opportunity, and um, very, very focused on a package of interventions to reduce, by the way, huge differences there between rural and urban, 
urban, mostly most, most maternal deaths due to hemorrhage um, in urban societies, um, mostly um, complications of pregnancy like eclampsia um, that, that required a, a different approach. But this focused uh, attention allow us to actually accelerate in a very meaningful way the rate of decline of maternal mortality, which actually uh, doubled that rate of decline uh, in those five years compared to the previous five years. So uh, maternal had been, mortality had been going down, but this doubled the rate of decline. And Mexico now has some of the, one of the lowest rates in Latin America, although we still have a long way to go because you know, we, we cannot accept one single maternal death. I mean, 99.9% .9 of those deaths are preventable, and that's, that has to be the goal. But then we expanded to the second circle, uh, sexual and reproductive health in addition to those related to pregnancy, childbirth. And uh, uh, that this included, uh, in a very major way, a whole effort to improve access to um, uh, fertility control by women and particularly, probably the most controversial thing I ever did in my life, which was the approval of emergency contraception and the introduction of that, uh, of emergency contraception in the essential drug list in Mexico, having verified that actually um, uh, sexual violence was a major source of unwanted pregnancies and of very negative uh, reproductive health outcomes. And although there was major opposition from conservative groups, and uh, from the uh, Catholic Church. In the end, the public opinion uh, enthusiastically endorsed this because evidence was mobilized in a very, very strong way to prove that this was actually to make a lot of sense, both uh, from a public health perspective, but also from any perspective uh, dealing with the reproductive rights of women. And th thirdly, we move to the third circle, particularly looking at other aspects of women's health. And here, violence against women was one of the key ones, as well as a very clear um, attack on uh, cervical and breast cancer. Um, and some interesting evidence, again, of how we've had this view, this simple view, that cervical cancer was the cancer of poor women and breast cancer, the cancer of rich women. That's long gone. I mean, we are witnessing a rise and true epidemic, particularly in breast cancer, uh, among poor women and among poor countries. And what's happening now is that the incidence of breast cancer is a global phenomenon. But dying from breast cancer is increasingly becoming something that only happens to poor women. Because the advance in, when there's timely treatment, the timely diagnosis, the advances in treatment are spectacular. But the gap is now in, know who gets it. It's spreading throughout the world. We're closing that gap, if you will, it's who dies from breast cancer, and that's why we have re recently launched a, um, a global task force to improve access to treatment and uh, control for cancer to see if we can do for cancer, not just breast cancer, but all kinds of cancers in developing country, if we can replicate the great advances that we have had on access to AIDS prevention and treatment. And then finally, uh, but by the way, when you deal with these cancers, particularly breast cancer, uh, you find that it's not just a medical issue. Um, and since Professor Spooner is an anthropologist, uh, and having myself had a very close opportunity to accompany my wife through her own uh, experience with breast cancer, we discovered that there's another cancer, a social cancer of machismo, of men who actually stop women from getting mammograms, and women who themselves suppress their own uh, demand for health services because they're afraid of the consequences that a positive diagnosis will have. And it, it, we need to fight this reductionist idea that women are a part of their body. And, we, and so I've always said that the fight against breast cancer is a fight for the dignity of women. And this is a huge part of the agenda, particularly in developing countries. And finally, the, la the, la the, the last circle, women and health, trying to introduce a gender perspective in all uh, health policy, starting even from the way we report statistics, with, which at least in Mexico was not even separated by sex, to adopting a gender approach to budgeting, to understanding the systematic biases in clinical research uh, and the differential responsiveness of health system to presenting symptoms on the part of women versus men. And a key part of this was to promote home care services to provide assistance because the burden of caring for chronically ill people 
disproportionately falls on women, and it's a major deterrent for female labor force participation. It's a failure of health systems when we, when we do not provide that support and simply privatize that on the shoulders of women who now, in addition to working at home, outside the home, now need to take care of a chronically ill person. A key part of this was also the uh, emphasis on the formal health work force, and I am especially proud of measures that were taken to improve the working condition of nurses and the appreciation they deserve as leaders in any well-performing uh, health system of the world. So um, let me conclude by saying that, I mean, obviously this recent chapter uh, in, in the saga of women and health is far from over. In Mexico, and indeed I believe in most of the rest of the world, there are still many, many challenges that must, must be addressed urgently. Salient among them are the further acceleration of the decline of maternal mortality to achieve the respective MDG, the attention to neglected emerging problems such as breast cancer and depression, the integration of traditional practitioners into healthcare teams with respect for multiculturalism, the development of effective home services to relieve women from the added burden of caring for chronically sick family members, the promotion of equal opportunities to end the gender stratification of the health workforce, and the empowerment of women in social programs. This challenge is notwithstanding, it is necessary to share globally the lessons learned from implementation of the comprehensive policy on women and health. And this brings us full circle to the topic with which I began. For health to continue to occupy a central place in the broader development agenda, it will be necessary to make knowledge a global public good that can sustain a virtuous process of shared learning among countries, which is why this conference is so important. So throughout this lecture, I have repeatedly referred to a framework that can be represented as a set of concentric circles. It is a powerful image, uh, full of symbolism. In certain cultures, it represents the womb of modern Mother Earth. It is also related to support, integration, and harmony. In her amusingly deep novel, The Cleft, Doris Lessing, winner of the 2007 Nobel Prize for Literature, draws a contrast between men and women which is, uh, which is uh, shall we say, less than favorable to us, the weaker sex. Uh, speaking of their solidity, she observes that, and I quote, women have been endowed with a natural harmony in the ways of the world. Those are her words. The image of the concentric circles evokes such harmony. The concentric circles are also meant to convey the complex connections between women and health particularly in these times of profound globalization and urbanization, when out of economic, security, and ethical considerations, we cannot afford to be oblivious to the fate of any person. This sense of connection is beautifully captured in the words of another Nobel laureate, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who wrote 40 years ago, and let me quote, it really, it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly." End of quote. Let us then continue to weave together a destiny where equity in all its dimensions will be the single garment clothing every woman and every man in our common planet. Thank you very much for your attention. First, I must bring you greetings from the University of Michigan. Go blue. <laughs> thank, you <laughs> for your, thank you for your inspiring remarks. Um, some of the statistics that you cited are very daunting, and I'm wondering if you could speak at all to the role of a public health initiative as opposed to the more traditional um, biomedical approach, which tends to be much more one-on-one um, -on -one or individually focused. Um, yes, of course. I, I mean, uh, what, what we do in public health is to 
try to understand the whole of society. We, we take a population level of analysis. And to me, global health is, is public health because what we do when we speak of global health is to take the entire population as a, as, as a whole. And then the units in which we organize ourselves in, in, in the planet, whether it's nations with a cultural identity, states, which are the sort of political organization of those nations, or you know, regional groupings, or uh, multi multinational corporations, or global civil society movements, or you know, I include among the actors in global health academic centers because we are charged with producing the quintessential global public, which, which is knowledge. Knowledge benefits everyone in the world. But, but what, so, you know, I always say there's no non-global public health. I mean, because what's different today is that there's no longer a distinction between global and domestic. It's, 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 it's one single continuum. But our vantage point in public health allows us to look at the entire population. And therefore, um, rather than just being in touch with those that happen to come and demand care in a particular facility, uh, we can look at, 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 the, at the whole picture. And like with cl the clinical side of medicine and nursing, we also you know, both diagnose problems, looking at the entire population, and we also prescribe. And this is the whole arena of uh, designing health systems that are responsive to the needs of people. And, and so, I, you know, it's a complementary view. We, we work very closely with, our, with, the, with the clinical sciences, um, uh, but public health is an essential part because it provides this societal perspective uh, that can encompass the entire globe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Marjorie Mecca from the University of Pennsylvania, and f I want to applaud all your work, but particularly what you achieved in Mexico, because it gives us so much hope for women. And I'm particularly impressed that you were able to include emergency contraceptive in the essential medicines. It truly gives us hope that women's control over her own body and how it is used can be assured. So I wonder if you would give us some more ideas and tell us more about how um, we can mobilize the value shifts that are necessary um, to provide a socio-cultural and religious and, and political space for um, such changes so that they can happen elsewhere. Um, we need that society can begin to treat women with such integrity? Um, it's it's, um, it's a, an episode of my tenure in government that I've uh, reflected a lot on because <laughs> it was the most uh, interesting part probably of uh, in terms of political uh, and very public and um, uh, loud debate. I, I think if I extract the lessons, I believe there's two fundamental lessons. One is really the power of good evidence. Um, uh, the, the second is the power of participation. Actually, it's three. And three is the fact that as democracy spreads and, you know, as, as living in cities spreads, uh, the notion that people really want to take control over their own lives. I mean, basically, um, I can tell you in, in a nutshell, uh, and uh, this was a very <laughs> complex episode, but we, what we did is, it, it was clear we, we had a, you know, family planning options for, for, for families who wanted, it's in the constitution, that the actual constitution says every individual, it doesn't say every couple, every individual has the right to freely decide on the number of spaces of children. Mm -hmm. It's a constitutional right. But between, as Lin Hunt, the famous historian of human rights has written, rights are easily, more easily endorsed than enforced. So um, how do you enforce them? How do you actually empower people to exercise rights that may be legally recognized? So one part was that we were missing that uh, because it had been a lot of opposition. And the essence of the public debate was both the, you know, in a country that's predominantly Catholic um, and in a government I was serving, which party in power to which I don't belong, I don't belong to any party, I was a technocrat, if you will, 
um, is a center of right party. Um, uh, the argument was that uh, uh, emergency contraception produced abortions. Um, through a deliberative process that literally took three years, where we included every single group that had anything to say, and we brought together all the evidence, it was clear that emergency contraception, quite to what was claimed, is probably one of the most effective means we have to prevent unwanted pregnancies and therefore abortions. And it was the power of that evidence that carried the day, a deliberative process where no one was excluded. And I took a very clear and firm stance that we respected everybody's personal beliefs. But when you are an elected of official, you cannot rule according to your ideological preferences, respectable as those are, but only according to scientifically derived knowledge. And that carry the day um, in, the, in the media, and then you know, the, the president of the country uh, actually endorsed this decision, so I didn't have to exercise uh, the option I had given him of uh, submitting my resignation if we were asked, if I was asked to withdraw that measure. But participation, good evidence, and then we carried out some opinion polls, and I can tell you that this was probably one of the most popular measures of the government. And even when you stratify the responses by degree of religiosity, very religious people do not like large institutions telling them how to, 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 to deal with their personal choices in intimate spheres of their lives. Our role in public policy is to provide the means for people to exercise those choices, not to dictate. And that goes whether it's government or any organized group of religion. So, to me, those, those were the three, the three lessons, participation, evidence, and just mobilizing society in its deep desire for control over their lives. Question there. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Frank. I have, full, um, first of all, I'm Ibrahim Ali. I'm a student at the University of Washington in Seattle and uh, an MPH Global Health student. And from Seattle, I have followed your work at the IHME and uh, the work of your wife in, with the Harvard group. And I'm currently working with the BAGI, which is the other group doing breast cancer in Seattle at the Hutchinson Center. And uh, what is happening now is that in developing countries, the, most of the health systems is uh, infectious disease focused. And we are gradually realizing that chronic diseases are kind of the new emerging problem in developing countries. And as global health practitioners, what do you think our approach should be in trying to put chronic diseases on the agenda in our role as trying to improve the status of women in these countries? Thanks very much. So very briefly, because I'm aware we're, we're out of time, um, we, we organized uh, with the French Hutchinson Institute in Seattle a, a conference on, on breast cancer in developing countries. All this evidence of the growing burden came up. But, but it's all over. I mean, the, just cardiovascular disease by itself accounts for more deaths than AIDS, TB, and malaria together every year. Now, what we should not do is create a new silo, and what we should not do is engage in this as a zero-sum game. That, you know, if we fund cancer, then it has to be at the expense of, of AIDS and TB, because we have this triple burden that I was talking about. What we have to do is learn about the, the, the lessons. I think AIDS, there's still a, long, a lot to do with AIDS, but this is one of the most amazing victories of global health. There's four million people in treatment for AIDS today, mostly in Africa, when only you know, less than a decade ago, everyone said it was impossible because antiretroviral therapy was so expensive and there were all these disputes around intellectual property and access. We somehow got over that and today there's four million people and international financing for AIDS has multiplied. We need to learn the lessons and apply it to the non-communicable health field. And we need to say that, to, to, we need to have policymakers understand that in health, we're always victims of our own success. It's exactly the success in reducing infectious diseases that allows people now, allows many, many people who would have otherwise died in early childhood to survive to ages where they get breast cancer or they get diabetes. And if we don't start thinking about that, we're just sowing the seeds of the next crisis rather than anticipating. So, you know, I like my good friend Paul Farmer from Harvard University's perspective. It's not either or. We, we have to face the, these two sides of the double burden 
uh, we need to finish the unfinished agenda and start preparing for success. And start preparing for success is deal with this new set of challenges that are already upon us. Thank you, Dr. Frank. We had to dismiss some of the questions because of time. Thank you, Thank you very much.